few years ago. And he is basically ex explaining how the database works. And he said that there's one point here, and then you go around, and then there's another audio sample there, and another one there. And because this is closer, they, this is the one which is matched. <laughs> it's like, and he explains everything like that. Sorry. Did you create an algorithm? Oh, immediately. So two days after you upload something, someone might do something similar, you know? I mean, we live in, this is exactly what the internet is for. This is what we wanted as society, and now we start complaining about it, which I think is so, I don't know, schizophrenic a little bit, you know? So I, I think it happens all the time, but it maybe doesn't happen in a meaningful or intentional way. I mean, obviously, way. I mean, obviously, some people are very intentional about taking an existing idea and then making it their own. But I think to an extent, any creative act is like that. I mean, even 20 years ago, people have made studies and said, like, the, the illusion of original thought basically boils down to 10% innovation to existing concepts, you know. And it's, I, I do believe that there are some things like memes, you know. I've been victim to them many times myself, and I know other people as well. And I don't, I don't try to fight it. You just have to be honest about it. That we all live in the same space, so we somehow have similar inputs and similar outputs as well. It's not X. And then I kind of already often came across Peter L. Paul Burke's site, which is, I think, the most uncredited human in that field. And we talked about it yesterday as well. He really should win some form of award for contribution. Um, so, I mean, I, I, he was a major influence for sharing code because back then in that field, like sharing just basic algorithms for like solving visual problems, most of the time, geo geometrical problems, there was nothing else out there. There was simply his website was the only resource there was really, in my opinion, and track. And I was looking around for really working more intentionally in open source. And then I came across processing, helped a little bit on that. And then also realized there are a bit differences in opinion, how things should be structured. And I really then started more working commercially and then set up my studio. And that was the moment when I really made the big decision that everything I do commercially now will actually just be an excuse indirectly to finance open source development. So the commercial more. But I would really turn down work if I felt it would not contribute anything new to that library collection I wanted to build. So in the first two years, I was really strict that every project I take on needs to hit in a different route. So I had like that one Nokia project, fi in a way, financing the physics engine, another project financed the color theory, and so on. And so slowly or rather fast, that library was growing. And now it is, I think, in a quite comprehensive state and now I'm far more focused for the last two three years on the actual architecture how things should be named how they should how the entire library should be structured what what kind of data types functions return how can you connect actually little processes into almost sentences to really in a way build micro workflows within your bigger process so it's like the whole paradigm because I really believe this is more the future in terms of being prepared for multi-core architectures and cloud computing and all that stuff where it really matters to be able to parallelize your process onto a number of machines or processors. And I don't think, and I really want, I'm more interested in building platforms I can also use for education and for just interactive programming, where I think a lot of those existing tools really not suck, but <laughs> are not optimal. Um, community a few years ago, I think, again, it is a little bit becoming insular that we have, in a way, all those tools we have now, which we are supposed to be uniting people and, in, in a way, teaching people more new skills, we have, again, the same kind of insular thinking that we have the processing cam, we have the open frameworks cam, we have the Cinder cam, we have the max MSP cam, pure data cam, all those things, in a way, exist in their own little universe, and there's not much crossbreeding going on between them, you know? And I really find it a bit sad.
And I, as my personal thing, I always was a kind of searcher to not really just stick with that one thing and think this is the best thing since sliced bread. And I'm stopping questioning now. I always question that because I always believe and knowing from personal experience, software can always be improved and always be refactored. And I really think this is true for communities as well and for technology in general. Yeah? And it's fine because it's so young, but we need to already start the questions where this thing could go. And you are, you, I was so excited. Basically, when I started computing, I started on East German hardware and we had absolutely nothing. We, those machines, they cost like the equivalent of three months of income and they came with literally nothing. Just a manual how to assemble it and <laughs> that was it. So we had like, that was it. So we had like a, an afternoon course in school when I was 13 and the task was basically to write our own game. And we had the whole school year time and we did it as a group. And this was, I think, the best school I ever had. It was the hardest school I ever had. We have, were having one computer, uh, one hour of computer time a week. Everything else had to happen with pencil and paper. We had the instruction table of all the CPU commands and you basically had to, as a 13-year-old, break down something you didn't even understand in practice and had to, in, in a way, encode it as numbers and then have th that one hour to hack it all in. And if you had one typo, that was it. That week was gone. And so it was, you know. And, but then the war came down. My parents donated all their saved up West German money to buy that one Atari for me. And the rest was history. And I basically joined the local computer club and one of those guys happened to be quite active as a demo coder. So we just clicked and I started making my own productions and started writing a chiptune synthesizer and then helped organizing some of those demo parties in East Germany and yeah. So, so younger. But the demo scene was basically starting out of the cracker culture in the 80s where you basically had people pirating computer games, but manipulating them, putting their little intro in. And after a short while, those intros seemed to be more impressive than actually the game. So you didn't just want that game, you wanted that cracked version of a game because it had this amazing intro you could show to your mates and everyone goes, wow, how did they do that? And, and can actually do, you know, we have people who write demos in 256 bytes. These are 256 numbers strung together to create an image or an animation. And this is incredible because the way you actually can only achieve this is by knowing every single bit about the technology underneath, knowing how, what command to use in which position so you can actually reuse the code as data to create something else. And it's incredibly cryptic but it shows incredible mental strength and intelligence to actually achieve something like that. And I always found it at the moment, there are terrible petabytes of data. It's so irrelevant because what really matters is what is the information content in that data. You know, data on its own is just noise. If no one processes that data, it's meaningless. It's really just dust, you know, and because it actually, people are really focused on producing such compressed version of information, not data, of really inf code is information. It's not random noise. Yeah? And that random, uh, that information can actually create a physical, emotional feedback in the viewer. And I find this really incredible. And the code is so microscopic, it can be easily shared. Yeah? If we talk easily shared, yeah, if we talk about virus writers, from a technical perspective, these are incredible pieces of work. Obviously, the intention and everything around it is very, very dangerous. But if you just look at it from a technical, purely technical point of view, the intellectual feats within that, why do we not learn that in school? Why do we not? Where is that can we not? Where is that kind of education which gives that, in a way, knowledge to people to misuse it in, in a lot of cases? And why can't we obtain that knowledge in our normal educational systems? 
Do you know what kind of software we could write if we would have that knowledge? If this would be actually be taught to us as kids? If we would actually understand technology to such a level of detail and to such an extent and actually and actually programming for me is always about the, more than it is talking to a machine, it is about figuring out how to break down a complex concept or system into such small components that they can actually be explained to a machine. Yeah? And this is purely an analytical skill. And analytics can be applied to anything. And if and this is really purely an analytical skill. And analytics you can apply to politics, all the complex problems we have in the world, like environmental issues, where no one actually really knows where to even start, how to solve those tasks, but where we could potentially use the analytical skills, which are instilled through programming, the discipline of programming, they could be really useful, I believe. And, and I, for instance, don't understand why, for instance, in the UK, it was in... 20 years ago, people learned programming in school, and these days, my kids learn PowerPoint. So, is it now more important to give presentations as IT skills, and this is considered an IT skill, or is it more important to learn something really how to understand the machines we work with? And, you know, I, I really believe maybe there is some interest by governments to not want that in a way, analytical skill in the wider population, because it might be a big threat. So, I mean, question, question. <laughs> you seem to you know, have those tools. I don't think it can only benefit, it can also obviously be used against society, as we just talked about with viruses. At the moment, I mean, viruses are not the viruses necessarily we know from five, six years ago. Viruses these days are the kind of botnets and all those. I mean, I'm, I'm putting now, I'm generalizing and putting everything in one term, but all those kind of massive scale denial of service attacks. Like, so why did I, why I'm really interested in teaching is really because I want those skills to be more available in the wider society. I want to have more conversations about all those topics with people, but at the moment it's sometimes, unless you talk to peers, it's not that easy to, to do because a lot of people simply immediately shut up when they hear the word code. It's something so alien still, unfortunately, that with machines, you know, code has nothing to do with computers as such. It is. And it's the abstract concepts behind them which I'm interested in. It's what code can enable using or being applied to machines, but also applied to, for instance, social hacking. You know, and and it's not that I want everyone to be a machine. It's absolutely not like that. But I think there's so much to be learned about our own nature. I think. Most of the time when I'm programming, I spend more time thinking about how to structure something, how it should be named, what are the kind of things, how they should fit together, rather than actually writing code. And blah, 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 because it's really, you can see the visual feedback. You can actually get immediate results which are interesting to our eyes and interesting to people who are absolutely new to this field. And I think. This is also one of the reasons why, for instance, processing really became that popular because it gives you that semi-immediate feedback. You know, by now there are already much better tools which give you really immediate feedback. You, know, you type one line of code, you press enter, and there's your result. You, you, blah, blah, blah. And it was really this huge cluster of thousands of tweets in within like 10 minutes about that one topic. And it's actually really amazing to be able to visualize that and then also see all the secondary connections which spin off from that. Yeah, when people then from black helicopters start talking about politics, starting to talk about all sorts of related things, and you can kind of follow those paths of conversation within that. Alone things take the field of data visualization, you know. I think it, it's so super helpful if you really do it properly, not just in a hype way. Um, but if we actually can use that discipline to engage more people with those topics to begin with. How many people really care how much 
energy London uses or how much noise there is or how much pollution there is. There's only such a small percent of the population still. Yeah? And we, we all own lives. But maybe if, if there is a constant stream of those messages which remind us that this is the situation surrounding us, we are partly responsible for it or fully responsible for it, then maybe it will sooner or later change the behavior of some more people. And I think it's, it's all about reaching tipping point, you know, and in fully, because we also don't even know the real size of the internet yet. We, we know the major connections, but there's that so-called dark net, which is unreachable by most search engines. And we don't know what's going on there. But I think the, the most interesting thing would be if you would combine that with a data visualization approach in, in the context of that a, all the actors within that space and within not just the space, also within that performance or whatever you want to call it, is not static, but could maybe be chosen by the viewer, you know? So you can have, for instance, a conversation about certain topics and because every, in a way, interview snippet is, has metadata associated, you can, in a way, create infinite conversations, even if you have a finite amount of material. I mean, nearly infinite. Obviously, if, if you have a finite source, you always get a finite outcome. But um, yeah, I mean, that could be interesting. I don't know. Do you need? No, I think I, I, I don't believe that any form of media ever dies out, you know? I mean, it maybe dies out in terms of, yes, there has been a catastrophic collapse of society, of some culture, or it simply became obsolete. But I think I don't think books will die out. I don't think analog, uh, like non-digital painting, will die out. All of those things will stick around, you know, because, and I also think they should stick around. All we actually do, if we introduce new media, we just make that landscape more rich. And why would I want that something which has been done several for several thousand years? Why would I want that to die out only because there's this new thing there? Yes, that new. If you believe in evolution, things will stick around as long as they have a purpose. If the purpose and if the, in a way, fitness is not up to it anymore, then they will go. You know? But in the end, I think as long as you have those not conflicting, but in a way, parallel channels of cultural activity, they, the longer they are around in parallel, the more crossbreeding will happen and the more in a way fit all of them will become. One of them will be your niche, you know. Maybe books will become something which is purely a collectible item, which you don't actually read anymore, but you just want to have as a something you can touch, you can browse through, feel the paper, hear the sound, whatever, you know, I don't know. But why should books totally go? Why should cinema totally go as we know it? You know, for instance, if you... Yeah, I'm sometimes quite scared of, of how, how fragile it just is. Like every time you lose a hard drive or something, it's like for a moment you think your world collapsed because you lost so much work. But then you also realize a lot of that, in a way, information is not as important to have as you think. It's earlier point, we need to keep some form of record in a, in a very persistent form, which helps future generations to understand the times we lived in and what we have done in those last hundred years, which we are probably the most crucial years of that civilization we are in at the moment. You know, in terms of impact, those last hundred years have caused more change than any other period before us. And I think that especially that period needs to be documented in utmost detail. 18. And this is something which I find absolutely amazing that we can emulate an entire hardware architecture with all its quirks. There's even a demo which I thought would never be able to be emulated because it's actually based on pulsing one of the special chips in the Atari in a certain way to achieve more colors per scan line. And even that works in the emulator. And I, this is incredible.
and having now that, like, I still have my Atari as physical object at home in Germany, but I haven't touched it in 15 years. And my kids have never seen it. They have never touched a real Atari, but they can play the stuff I did 20 years ago, you know, more than 20 years ago. So 